Anthony Ping, or as many of us call him, Anton. He goes by either. Uh, his wife prefers the Anton. So we decided that, at least uh, Angie and I decided to call him Anthony since his wife preferred that. <laughs> so um, so uh, Anton has uh, uh, an interesting background. So he graduated from Cornell University uh, with a background or with a degree in electrical and computing, uh, computer engineering which is kind of an interesting thing. As I've gotten to know more of our faculty, a lot of them come from a background and things you wouldn't necessarily think would go into uh, neuroscience or neuroscience related type of uh, things, but uh, Anton is one of them. He got his PhD from MIT and in speech and hearing biosciences and technology. And then he did a couple of postdoctorates, one of which, the last most recent one was at Stanford University. We uh, hired him from that position in, onto our faculty in 2015. So he's one of our newer faculty members. And uh, he's a hearing researcher, and you'll get to hear a lot more about that, as, as you can see. So Anton, I'll turn it over to you. And, and so so um, today I'm going to talk mainly about kind of what is it that, how is it that the hearing system works, kind of give you guys the background. And now, I, I don't know how these are, how these go, but I figured that what you guys probably would get most out of it is understanding maybe a little bit and learning about how our auditory system works. I know that Occam and Dan have talked to you already, um, but I think they probably left out one of the most critical parts of the hearing system, which is the ear, um, <laughs> since they are more central. Uh, so if I do, if I do overlap with them, because they, they study more central things, and, I, and what I study is basically right here in the, the inner ear, um, but if I do overlap, I apologize, uh, but hopefully I'll still provide some, some new information. All right, so I'm gonna start out today by just going, doing, the, the majority of the time we'll kind of be talking about an overview of how our auditory system works or how specifically our ear, our peripheral auditory system works. And then go into some of the mechanisms of cochlear amplification, which is uh, a process that gives us the some of the major features, I guess, of our auditory system that kind of make it quite remarkable. And then a little bit into what our research is about. And then I'm gonna talk, just last thing, just touch on a thing called hidden hearing loss, uh, just because it's a fairly new idea in the field um, and may be very relevant to kind of your lives or maybe you know people that have experienced this, but just there hasn't necessarily been a name or a mechanism that's associated with it previously. All right, so let's go start with the hearing unit. So our auditory system is quite remarkable in the sense that we can actually detect the huge range of sound intensity levels. So in a quiet room, you can hear the pin drop, but you can also, if you're sitting on the aircraft carrier, actually hear the loud, the like really loud sounds of a fighter jet launch, okay? And these sound intensities actually span uh, 12 orders of magnitude in intensity. In addition to our sensitivity of hearing, which allows us to hear quiet sounds, we have a really good frequency selectivity. So two keys on the piano differ by 6% in frequency, but we can actually discriminate much better than that down to actually just 0.2% differences in frequencies. And so these are actually features that the peripheral auditory system, which is what I'm gonna talk about today, actually encode, and this is kind of where the information originates, and then this information is then passed on to uh, the central nervous system to then allow us to process complex things like, like speech. So this is a speech spectrogram. Here you have different frequencies and then this is the intensity of the frequencies you can think of over time. So in, as you can see, our speech uh, sounds are very complex, made up of many different frequencies that span various ranges. And in addition, the central auditory system also processes sound to allow us to localize things. And that's likely what uh, a lot of what Dan and Occam talked about. So the sound localization pathways. <clears throat> um, so as I talked about, you know, we have this incredible ability to hear a large range of sound levels. And so this is kind of, this is, we state sound intensities on a dBSPL scale. And so zero dB SPL is essentially what the threshold of hearing is. So what's the smallest or the quietest sound that you can actually hear? And it goes up to, that's like 140, sometimes even 160 for some other things. But let's say a pistol 
shot is around 140 dB SPL. Okay. And so our auditory system at the, at the level of the threshold can actually detect these mechanical motions that are just three angstroms. It's like a very, very small uh, motion. And so <clears throat> this is one of the, in a sense, the feats of the auditory system is to be able to actually detect sound intensities uh, or mechanical vibrations down to such small uh, motions. Quick question. So an, an angstrom, I'm not familiar with that uh, unit. So, what is that? So an angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer. Okay. So, so you're talking about a wavelength of sound being? No. Like so, that? Is that well, no. So this is in terms of how much, how much the, the air is vibrating. In the gotcha. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have a dynamic range, uh, you know, over 100, probably about 130 dB or maybe even more, you could argue. Um, we have a frequency, humans are able to hear a frequency range from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, so three orders of magnitude in, in frequency. And then this ITD, which is the interall time difference, and again, this is more something that Dan and Akka probably talked about, is our ability to spatially localize sound. So we have, uh, we're able to detect, you know, very small differences in that, in, in the onsets of sounds you can think of. Uh, and this is more for the, for the sound localization. So hearing loss is fairly prevalent. And here is like, here is uh, kind of like an OSHA limitation in terms of how loud a sound is. Based on how loud a sound is, there's a certain amount of time that you should, you should limit your exposure to. So the louder the sound is, the shorter the amount of time that you should be exposed to that level of sound. So, you know, things like, if you're on a even a riding lawnmower, you know they say you know don't do that for more than let's say two hours or so, all right? Before you might start to actually incur some some hearing damage, some permanent hearing damage. And so, one in three older people or people older than sixty, and half of those actually older than eighty-five actually have some sort of hearing loss. And approximately ten percent of Americans um, between twenty and sixty-nine already have suffered some form of permanent hearing. And the reason that hearing loss is permanent is because the sensory cells, which I'm going to talk about today, the sensory cells that encode this information or transmit this information in the brain do not regenerate. So the ones that you're born with are the ones that you have for the rest of your life. If you damage them in any way, you basically then get some sort of permanent hearing loss associated with that. Okay? So noise is one of these mechanisms of losing this hearing. And I'll talk about some of the other ones a little bit later. Okay, so how is it that the ear actually detects sound? So here is a schematic of kind of slicing through your ear, you can think of. Starts with the outer ear, right? So you can see the, the pinna or the ear lobe down here, right? And so this ear actually helps to funnel some of the sound and actually creates some filtering based on some spectral properties of, of how your ear folds are. And actually so then funnels the sound in through the ear canal and this sound then hits the tympanic membrane. So up until now, you have basically a pressure wave. And then at the tympanic membrane, this pressure wave is then converted into a mechanical vibration. Right? So you can think of this eardrum basically vibrates according to that pressure wave. That vibration then causes these middle ear ossicles or middle ear bones to vibrate. And these middle ear bones are consist of the malleus, the incus, and stapes. Some people also call them the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. So these are kind of two sets of names given for these bones. And these middle ear bones then basically transmit the vibration <laughs> into the inner ear. Okay? And then this, the, the, the stapes actually causes some kind of like a, a vib uh, uh, almost like a pumping motion you can think of on the fluid filled spaces of the inner ear in order to cause a wave to happen. And I'll talk about kind of where that wave um, comes from. Okay, so. <clears throat> Now, this is the, the whole kind of inner ear. And so it consists of both the vestibular system as well as the auditory system. And so it's, it's kind of separated here. So this is the auditory part of the inner ear. And then this is the vestibular part. So the vestibular part is our sense of balance. So it tells us, uh, is the head rotating? So this is the canals uh, encode rotational motion of the head. And then there's the utricle and the sacculus. Uh, over here, right, so utricle and sacculus, 
or Saculus is over here, sorry. The Uchicle and Saculus that encode linear acceleration. So it also tells us, you know, uh, how is our head moving like translationally? Okay. So that's the vestibular system, and it's actually continuous. The fluid, the fluid filled spaces are somewhat continuous with the with that of the inner ear, with the cochlea. All right. So I'm going to focus today, though, on the on the cochlear side of things. And so if you take a cross section through this cochlea, so this is a coiled structure. You can see then the coiled structure kind of rises up like this, and the cochlea itself itself is composed of multiple fluid compartments. So you have what they call the scala vestibuli, the scala tympani, and then the scala media. It's also the types of fluid is endolymph and perilymph. So the scala tympani and vestibuli both contain perilymph, and then the scala media has a fluid called the uh, called perilymph. Or sorry, called endolymph. I don't know if I messed that up. So perilymph in these two, and then endolymph in this one. And so this endolymph is a special solution that actually bathes the sensory cells of the, inner, of the ear. Okay? And then this, the organ that actually detects the sound is, sits in here, actually. It sits right here. So this is the organ of Cordy. And so if we zoom in on that, then you see that the organ of Cordy is, consists of a couple of different um, structures. Okay? So the organ of Cordy sits on this basilar membrane. And so we'll talk about the basilar membrane in in more detail in, in subsequent um, slides. But this is what where the vibration basically travels down. So there's a vibration from the stapes. This basically causes a vibration in the basilar membrane. Okay. And then you have these structures, these sensory cells, which are we call hair cells. And so the hair cells are actually divided into two types in the in the ear. We have inner hair cells which, and there's one row of that, and then there's outer hair cells, and there's three rows of outer hair cells. At the top of the hair cells are what, we call, are what we call the hair bundle, and this hair bundle is really what I study um, most, most intensely, let's say. Um, but this hair bundle is what actually converts a mechanical, the mechanical motion into an electrical signal that the cell detects. And then for, in the, for the case of inner hair cells, there's, uh, they take this signal and basically send that signal to the brain for, for processing by the brain. And so an inner hair cell is actually innervated, meaning where they, they, they send information to the brain from about 15 to 30 or 15 to 20 or so um, synapses. And these, each synapse is actually attached to a single auditory nerve fiber. Okay. Um, and so there's a division of labor between these cells. So the inner hair cells essentially detect the sounds, or let's say detect the vibrations and send it to the brain. And then the outer hair cells are what I'm gonna talk about is, is responsible for the cochlear amplifier. So this cochlear amplifier is things that gives us this kind of dynamic range and frequency selectivity. So I'll go into more of that uh, later. But it's the outer hair cells that are actually responsible for this amplification process. Anton, uh, the yeah. word Amplify or amplification as you're using it is it sounds like using it differently than probably most of us think of when we think of a, like a stereo amplifier. So you can think of it as very similar uh, okay. in the sense that it's amplifying like a small vibration and making it larger such that the inner hair cells, for instance, can detect it more readily. But it's okay. what it, it's doing very similar thing in terms of making the sound louder. But in addition, the cochlear amplifier. In addition to just making it louder, it actually tunes it as well. So it makes the, the frequency tuning sharper. And I'll talk about uh, what, that, what that means hopefully a little bit later. Okay. So again, why is it important to study hearing? So first, all the hair cells that we're born with are the ones that we have for the rest of our lives. And so noise-induced hearing loss is a common way to lose this hearing. So if you're exposed, as I talked about, exposed to lots of sound, Age-related hearing loss, just over time, as you get older, there's some genetic susceptibilities that some people's hearing system deteriorates a little bit more readily or more easily than others. There's aminoglycosides, which are, um, which are an antibiotic that's, that's used commonly in, in, in infants when they're first born. The reason they're used so Prevalently, even though there's actually a side effect of hearing loss, a potential side effect of hearing loss is that they are very broad spectrum, meaning they kill a lot of different types of bugs, different bacteria, um, and, and 
they're kind of, let's say, fast act, or I guess no. the main reason is they're broad spectrum. So in infants, when they're first born, if they don't know what the infection is, but they know the child has an infection, they give them the glycosides because it's most likely to kill that bacteria. Um, but one of the potential side effects is that you can actually cause hearing loss due to that. So you can actually cause permanent hearing loss in, in infants. Um, and then another one is actually cisplatin. And cisplatin is a chemotherapeutic, um, but one of the side effects is also permanent hearing loss that's associated with cisplatin. <clears throat> okay, so the cochlea itself is actually a frequency analyzer. I don't know if you know, you guys know what that is, but it's basically the idea is that along the cochlea, we can detect different frequencies and different parts of the cochlea vibrate. This is not showing up, so I'm just going to do this because this, at least in the past, has worked to make it show up. Okay, so it acts as a frequency analyzer, okay, and such that the space works. So if we, so this is kind of how sound comes in through the ear, goes to the middle ear bones, and then eventually, if we uncoil the cochlea, so this is now looking essentially at the basilar membrane, okay. So the basilar membrane is somewhat continuous, and so what happens here is, is that Along this basilar, oh crap. Along this basilar membrane, so that's some other YouTube video playing now because I clicked on it accidentally. So along this basilar membrane. Basically, different parts of the basilar membrane will vibrate depending on the frequency of the sound. Okay, so if you unravel the, the cochlea, different parts of the, of the basilar membrane basically will vibrate depending on the frequency sound such that closest to the, to the base is high frequency and then low frequency sounds are furthest from the base. So this is called, we call the apex versus the base of the cochlea. So at the apex, <laughs> at the apex, the lower frequency sounds will vibrate it more readily and then at the base, higher frequency sounds such that you can basically decompose a sound into its frequency components along the cochlea. Oh, wow. Okay, so you can see all the low frequency sounds are vibrating the base, and then as you increase the frequency, it vibrates, uh, sorry, at the apex. Low frequency sounds vibrate the apex, and then as you go to higher frequency, it, it, it vibrates towards the base, okay? Hmm. Does it, are the cells specialized to get different frequencies or does it have to do with the actual, like, width or volume of the cochlea at that point? So it had, so there's a couple of things that, that go into, go into this. So a large part is that the basilar membrane itself is intrinsically tuned to a certain frequency. So based upon its thickness and the width of it, it vibrates at, or it has, in a sense, a resonant frequency attuned to, depending on the location, okay? 
So a large part of it is the basilar membrane itself, but then there's other things. There's other tuning mechanisms as well. So like, for instance, the hair bundles that I talked about, they actually vary in size and shape. And then those will also change um, the characteristic frequency that they are most sensitive to. And then there's some other processes, electrical processes that I'll kind of go into um, that also could tune the signal as well. Okay, so along the basilar membrane, so that 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 video is kind of is is not completely accurate in terms of what the waves look like, but there is a traveling wave. Okay, and then this is kind of like what a a passive passive cochlea would look like that if this is the the bit uh, the base of the of the cochlea and then this is now distance from the base you can see that there are certain areas that the basilar membrane will vibrate kind of at its largest magnitude so this is the magnitude and this is the location and so depending on the frequency of the sound lower frequency sounds vibrate it further up towards the apex most uh, at the largest or the let's say peak vibration is closest to the to the apex and as you increase the frequency the peak vibration starts to shift towards the base such that in the ba in the basal regions you're actually encoding more of the higher frequency sounds okay so when people lose their hearing often at high frequencies that's usually what goes first and so sometimes i don't know if anyone's ever played like a like a 16 kilohertz tone like on their speakers and some people are like you know it's like it's like you hit play and they're like i don't hear anything and other people are like oh what is that sound like because <laughs> it's just it's the high pitch sounds sometimes are seem somewhat painful the mosquito ring is another one uh -huh. kids ever do the mosquito ring it's basically a high frequency thing that often kids can hear but adults can't <laughs> but all right, so anyway, so the so depending on the location within the cochlea, different areas vibrate most readily depending on the frequency of the sound. All right, and so as that basilar membrane vibrates, what happens is this so this is the basilar membrane seen in blue here. So as this thing is vibrating, so meaning it moves up, then what happens is it causes a shearing motion on the on that hair bundle, on that stereocilia hair bundle such that you're deflecting the stereocilia hair bundle and then this actually then activates um, channels to then signal the cell to say, hey, there was a, there was a, mo there was a movement. Okay. So this is a, a, a scanning electron micrograph of the, of the cochlea. You can see again the inner hair cells and then the outer hair cells. And if you zoom in on the outer hair cells, you can see that a given hair bundle is actually composed of a couple of rows of these, what we call stereocilia. So there's three rows of these stereocilia. And then <laughs> the model of basically how this system works to detect the motion looks like this. So between these stereocilia, there's actually a filamentous tip link. And this tip link actually connects uh, shorter rows of stereocilia with their adjacent taller row. And then you can think of it as this hair bundle is deflected and you get the shearing motion, what happens is you create a stretch within this tip link. Okay? And this stretch of the tip link then is essentially translated to the two mechanotransduction channels which detect this stretch and allow ions to flow into the cell. And I mentioned before that there's two types of hair cells, the inner hair cell. So this is a, a hair bundle from an inner hair cell and this is the hair bundle from the outer hair cell. So this is these types of cells are responsible for the amplification, and these cells are more responsible for just the detection of the of the basilar membrane motion. Does the shape of the bundle have? Yeah, they're very different, right? Yeah. Um, so we don't know fully how the shape contributes. So this shape is very characteristic of mammalian here. Um, of the mammalian auditory system. So through evolution, there's been lots of changes that actually ha happen to the auditory system. Uh, one of the things, for instance, is the fact that the mammals are the only ones with the cochlea, so meaning the coiled structure. All other animals um, besides mammals have more of, uh, or have a papilla, which is basically like an elongated, so it's like an unrolled cochlea, you can think of it, right? 
And so for instance, the chicken has a papilla, which is basically looks like a, a long tube, right? Um, so there's been, through evolution, there's been a lot of changes with the mammalian system. And one of the features that has come about from that is also high frequency hearing. Um, so for instance, the next highest frequency hearing animal is the bird that hears, like the barn owl can hear maybe about 10 kilohertz or so. Um, Whereas man, like we hear to 20 kilohertz, but mice and rats, for instance, hear to like 80 kilohertz. Um, so I guess the answer is the shape may be contributing something and likely is contributing something, um, but we don't necessarily know what that is. I think for this, the specialization here, um, so one of the things is that the this is more, the inner hair cell detects more fluid motion. And then because of that fluid motion, we think that it has a much longer um, tall row, like this, this tall row of cilia, because it acts more like a sail. Think of it, the longer it is, then the more likely it is to be able to detect that fluid motion, to kind of catch, let's say, the motion of the fluid. So again, the process of, the process of mechanotransduction is that conversion of the mechanical motion into an electrical signal. And so if we deflect it in the positive direction and we define positive deflections as towards the tallest row of cilia, so this is, this is a positive direction, what happens is we generate a stretch in the tip link and that tip link then causes the mechanotransduction channels themselves to open. And when you get an opening in the channel, what the cell responds with is, a, is an inward current. So meaning ions flow into the cell to depolarize the cell, meaning they increase the voltage of the cell, such that then um, the cell, let's say, detects or has a signal that, uh, that the bundle has been deflected. That's really interesting because we've heard quite a bit about ion channels from some of the other faculty. And it sounds like a very different mechanism for opening it. Then. Yeah, so, so most of the other ion channels, it's like, so there's voltage-gated ion channels. There's ligand gated, so meaning in the presence of specific compounds that they open. But this one is specifically with the mechanical stimulus. So some sort of mechanical stress, and the, these channels actually open. Interesting. And so these, I mean, mechanotransduction channels are also responsible for your sense of touch. So like all your, your sense of touch requires mechanotrans, uh, some sort of mechanically activated ion channel. Um, there's other things like, you know, in your heart, cells sense stress and whatnot, and bacteria also sense cell, cell membrane stretching and things like that. So there are a lot of different types of mechano, mechanosensitive ion channels. All right, so to kind of go through what happens again, so as we displace the hair bundle, then this causes the channels to open. This causes positive charge to build up in the cell. And this positive charge then causes the release of neurotransmitters at the synapses. And this release causes, uh, then basically signals the nerve fibers to say there's been some detection of sound, <coughs> which then sends it to the brain. So then kind of putting this together then, so you have hair, so this is now, we unrolled the cochlea again, this is the base of the cochlea and this is the apex of the cochlea. And you have now hair cells situated all along the whole length of the cochlea. So then hair cells in a given region, when they are sending, when, they're, when their nerves become activated, basically tells the brain, hey, I've heard a frequency of, let's say one kilohertz, okay? And then if something over here is activated, the brain knows, okay, well, we, I heard a frequency of 100 hertz, right? And then if something over here is, you know, I heard a frequency of 10 kilohertz, okay? So depending on which hair cells actually get activated, then the brain knows what the actual frequency um, of the sound is, okay? So does anyone have questions on this part so far? Okay, so in the next part then, I'm gonna go on to kind of go into a little bit more cochlear amplification. So in the passive cochlea, or you can think of it as a dead cochlea, the basilar membrane will still vibrate, right? As I mentioned before, it has some intrinsic tuning properties such that you get a maximum amplification, let's say, 
depending on the, the location along the basal membrane, along the, the length of the cochlea. Okay, but in a live or healthy cochlea, what you get is you or what sorry, what you see is that the response is actually much larger than the response of the passive cochlea. So what this tells us is that there's an active mechanism to to actively amplify the sound or amplify that motion of the basilar membrane in order to achieve a larger um, vibration for a given sound intensity level. Okay, and so. This amplification, so I talked about the cochlear amplifier. One of the features of the cochlear amplifier is that it increases the amount of the signal. Okay, so it causes some amplification. But the second thing it does is it actually increases tuning. So this is a tuning curve. And so tuning curve, so frequency is plotted here and threshold is here. Um, and so these, you can think of this as sound intensity levels. And so if you look at a given spot, along the cochlea and measure the amount of vibration, you look at what's the softest sound that will cause a fixed amount of motion at that location, okay? So in this case, you can see that at 15 kilohertz, this, uh, this location does not lead, need a very loud sound in order to vibrate that amount. So let's say it's, it's two, two or one nanometer of, of vibration. And then as you change the frequency away from the, what we call the characteristic frequency, basically the frequency that that spot is most sensitive to, then you can see that there's a fall off in terms of the amount or the sensitivity. So meaning that you need louder and louder sounds in order to get to vibrate that same amount. Okay. So this is in an active cochlea or a live or healthy one. But in a passive one, so if we basically allow the, the cochlea to die or allow then what happens is, is that this tuning, so there's both an amplification loss, but you can see the tuning is also a lot broader. So meaning that there's not a sharper point here. It's not just that this thing has just shifted up and, and that you still have a point, but just it's less sensitive, but it's the fact that it's actually also lost its tuning. So tuning basically takes something that's broad and actually sharpens it up such that a smaller spot of the cochlea actually, let's say, vibrates maximally due to a given sound, okay? So these are basically the two features that, um, or one, two, two of the major features that, that the cochlear amplifier uh, does. Okay, so question is how is it achieved? So those, the outer hair cells, as I mentioned, these are the ones responsible for the cochlear amplifier, have an interesting, uh, mechanism or interesting process, and this is called somatic motility. So, so somatic motility, what it does is based on the voltage of the hair cell, it can change actually the length of it. So at a given potential, if you increase the voltage of the cell, then the cell actually shrinks. If you decrease the voltage of the cell, the cell actually expands. So you can think of this ability to move then as a way to be able to amplify, let's say, the motion of this basilar membrane. Okay, and so I've got another video here, but I don't know if it's going to show up. So I'm going to have to do this again. Hopefully it won't take as long this time. Okay, so in this scenario, what we're going to do is there's a, there's a pipette. This is a patch pipette, so we're able to control the voltage within the cell. Okay, and then we're going to basically send various voltages One, two, three, four, and you can basically get the cell to move or to dance. Okay, and so what they're doing here is they're actually just taking the song and taking the envelope of the intensity and then feeding that envelope in here and so you can see that it basically bounces the beat. Right? Wow. So this ability to move or this somatic motility is thought to underlie this amplification, it, or we know is, is absolutely important, uh, critical to this cochlear amplifier process. Because if we get rid of the ability to do that, we no longer get cochlear amplification. Okay. But there was a, there's another mechanism that's thought to contribute. And this is largely done in experiments in lower vertebrates, so frogs and turtles. But as you open the channel, 
the opening and closing of the channel actually causes uh, a mechanical response also in the hair bundle, okay? Such that if you don't do anything, you don't touch the system, you don't perturb the system, and you measure the motion of the hair bundle and just monitor how the hair bundle moves, you can get these kind of sinusoidal movements of the hair bundle, okay? And this is, and these are different, each trace is basically a different cell, and so different cells have different characteristic frequencies or frequencies that they're tuned to. So you can see, in this case, this cell is tuned to, let's say, a higher frequency, so it moves at a higher rate. It's, it's more, it wants to move at a higher uh, frequency than, than some of these other cells, for instance, okay? So this ability for the hair bundle itself to move was thought to be another mechanism that could amplify this motion of the, of the basilar membrane. Okay. And so there's basically been a debate for quite some time about we have basically the mechanisms within the hair cell, which is the hair bundle motility, and also the somatic motility. And then we have these features of the cochlear amplifier, which is frequency tuning and amplification. And so this, it's been argued in terms, like, you know, people that study hair bundle motility would say, no, hair bundle motility can do it all. And then other people that study somatic motility say, well, we know it's absolutely necessary, so why do you even study this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, but I think that there's, it's, again, I think there's, in a sense, a division of labor. Like, in this sense, I think that the hair bundle is actually responsible more for the tuning aspect. And the reason is, is that there are mechanisms that I'll discuss a little bit about how the hair bundle can actually cause this tuning. Whereas somatic motility, this process does not have an intrinsic tuning ability, meaning that it just follows the voltage of the hair cell. Okay. There's no way for it to actually cause this tuning, but it obviously can cause this amplification because you can think of this motion as, as increasing the, the, the amount of the vibration. Okay. So questions on that? Or... So then what we do is we study this mechanotransduction process and basically look at how, what are the mechanisms of mechanotransduction and how do they contribute to this cochlear amplification process. And so to do that, what we do is we patch onto these, ha these hair cells. So we, we stick an electrode onto the basal lateral side, so the bottom side of the cell. And then we bring a stimulator to the apical side of the cell to stimulate the hair bundle directly. So instead of using sound, we just use a mechanical stimulator. We have a perfusion system that also then allows us to just control the fluid that bathes the, the hair bundles, to so control the ionic environment you can think of. Um, surrounding the hair bundle itself so that we can, we can manipulate the, the, the process. And so this is just a zoom in. So you can see these are the hair bundles that, you know, taken from an image from like our microscope. And then so we bring in a, a stimulator to actually directly stimulate the hair bundle itself. <laughs> so we use, a, we use a, a technique called voltage clamp. So we hold the voltage, excuse me, of the cell constant, and then we deliver a step stimulus in the probe. And so as we, as we deflect the hair bundle in the positive direction, this causes a rapidly activating inward current to the cell to respond with rapidly activating inward current. This current actually then declines over time and through a process called adaptation, which I'll talk about in, in a sec. Um, but this is, you can see the stimulus is constant, but the current actually declines. So this mm -hmm. process of adaptation. We can do this for many different step sizes to generate this family of curves. And then you can actually, we can characterize essentially the characteristics of the channel, the mechanic transduction channel itself, by plotting the peak current um, for, uh, elicited for each displacement step to generate an activation curve. And this activation curve then describes, say, the sensitivity of the channel before any stimulus actually happens. In addition to recording the currents, if we use certain types of stimuli, like a fluid jet, which I'm going to show you here, we can actually stimulate the hair bundle and track the motion of the hair bundle. So we use high-speed imaging. So in this case, we're using 10,000 frames a second. We're imaging the hair bundle at 10,000 frames per second. And then I just have this red line in for you to see, just kind of, just as a guide, or as, a, as a fixed point. 
but we can actually then um, track the position of the hair bundle, extract basically from these videos the position of the hair bundle. And so you can see that the hair bundle doesn't make a square motion in this case with the, with the fluid tip, but has this kind of uh, complex rise to it. What kind of animal model do you use? So this one is taken from a rat. So we use rats, mice, and some gerbils. And do you do this like in a single, single cell or do you do an vivo kind of experience or some combination? So this is, so we, we dissect out the organ of cordy. So in like, so this is a dissected organ of cordy. So this is basically, you have all the rows of hair cells going along here. And so you have, Kind of like one row of inner hair cells and then the three rows of outer hair cells and then so we dissect out the that organ put it into a dish and then we record from a single cell at a time so it's a single yeah, it's a single cell technique and so this process of adaptation is defined as a declining current due to a sustained stimulus that can actually then be recovered if we stimulate further. So if we then push the bundle further, we can actually recover that current. Okay. Is that like the phenomenon you experience when your neighbor starts up their lawnmower and it kind of annoys you at first, and then before you know, a couple of minutes are up, you don't even notice it even though it's still going on. Is that? So yeah, so, so it's possible that this process plays a role in that. That is an adaptation process, uh, but there, there may be other processes also associated with that. Uh, there's also synaptic adaptation, um, and then there's probably some things in your brain as well that over time they just start to ignore it. So it's the same thing, like sometimes like you hear a tone bothers you at first, but then over time, it's like with, with smell too, your smell adapts as well, right? Um, so if we take an activation curve both before and after the adapting step, we can actually see that the activation curve shifts. And the shift in the activation curve then, you can think of it as shifting the range of sensitivities that the hair cell is sensitive to, right? So it could be kind of associated with this. But it also, then this ability to shift the range also can increase the dynamic range. So you can think of it as Let's say originally we're only able to detect this range of sound intensities, let's say. But if that curve shifts, then we now can detect a new range of sound mm. intensities, right? So now it's increased the dynamic range of the system. And additionally, it can act as a high pass filter because anything that's moving, let's say moving slowly, you can think of as being rapidly adapted away, right? So that you get little to no perceptible current. And if there's no current, then there's no signal sent to the brain, right? So this ability of, or basically the rate of, at which adaptation happens can set a high pass filter and help, and hence um, act as a tuning mechanism as well, okay? So the lab basically studies this adaptation process, okay? And what are the mechanisms associated with the adaptation? How is it functioning? What are the molecules actually involved? and then such that we're developing models in terms of how the auditory system works. And the idea here is that if we understand how the normal auditory system works, then we can start to understand what's actually happening in, in disease and, and, and like let's say noise-induced hearing loss and things like that. If we understand these mechanisms, then we can maybe actually then uh, reinforce or, or protect certain parts of these mechanisms that may be susceptible to overstimulation damage due to loud noises, for instance. And so in the process, we, all, we uh, kind of one of the things that we do a lot of, I feel, is kind of developing new technologies in order to kind of push the boundaries of what we're able to record and what we're able to see. Okay. So questions on that? So the last thing I'm just gonna touch on very briefly is called hidden hearing loss. You or maybe you know somebody um, that says, you know, I have no problem talking to you in an environment like this where there's no other conversations going on. But then if you go to a bar or a restaurant that's noisy, they can often no longer follow the conversations that are going on. Okay. And so this is known as the cocktail party effect. So one of the major, uh, let's say, gripes of people that wear hearing aids is this fact that they cannot 
handle this type of situation in quiet environments, hearing aids, for instance, work. But this is even for normal hearing listeners. So people that have, can normally hear in a normal conversation when it's, when it's quiet around. But then suddenly they go to a bar or a restaurant and it's like, it's just, it requires either a lot more work or they just, they have a very hard time following the conversation, right? And so we knew that this happened, this, was a, this type of situation was an issue for hearing aid users, but there's a growing appreciation that this is actually probably happening to people that had normal thresholds. So the way that in the clinic that people test thresholds, or that, that clinicians, the audi audiologists test thresholds is they play tones and they say, you know, they have you raise your hand when you can hear the tone, right? And so in this case, people that can ha have these normal thresholds still have a problem in this type of situation, okay? And so recent research has basically suggested that Okay, so this is now a schematic of the inner hair cell again. And so we, again, we have 15 to 20, let's say, uh, nerve fibers per hair cell in a, normal, in a normal healthy person, let's say. <laughs> and this, this is now labeling the synapses, basically how many of the synapses are present. So in the normal animal, you have, let's say, the 15 to 20 synapses. But then if you expose these animals to, <coughs> to noise, which doesn't cause a permanent threshold shift, but causes a temporary threshold shift. And that's defined as, for instance, if you go to a rock concert, it's like, let's say you're in the front row, super loud, right afterwards, you might not be able to hear as well, but maybe 24 hours later, your hearing comes back. Okay, so that's called a temporary threshold shift. So if you, if you cause a temporary threshold shift, what could happen is, is that maybe your thresholds don't change. And actually they measured this in these animals at least, that the thresholds don't change, but what's happened is that you've lost a whole bunch of nerve fibers innervating the hair cell, okay? So if you can think of it as, even though you can still detect the sound, your ability to, let's say, detect certain features of the sound are diminished, okay? Because you don't have as much information going to the brain anymore. And then so in this case, they think that this hidden, so they term this hidden hearing loss because their auditory thresholds are normal, but they obviously have a loss of, of processing ability. And so they think that this hidden hearing loss, even though people have always thought of temporary threshold shifts as not causing permanent damage, that they actually think that these, per these temporary threshold shifts actually are now causing some level of permanent damage. Right? But that is just that we could not detect it previously, therefore the name hidden, right? So, questions? I had one. Yeah. Um, where is vertigo? I mean, in the is that part of the cochlear thing? It's part of the vestibular system. Okay. So there's so vertigo is the balance system. It's all in the inner ear. They're all connected, and so sometimes there are auditory things associated with it. So uh, there are things called Meniere's disease, which is uh, a problem when you have issues in you often have tinnitus, so you hear this ringing in your ear, mm -hmm. and you often have bouts of vertigo. And so there, I think there's a lot of different etiologies, but sometimes they're somewhat, they're, things are linked just because they're all in that same. So because my dad has tinnitus, he gets the vertigo, because he often has vertigo. Yeah. That is causing right. the vertigo? The, the so it's not necessarily the tinnitus is causing the vertigo, but they could be caused by the same underlying okay. problem. Okay. So often. Yeah, so, so yeah, there's often some like auditory and vestibular type dysfunction sometimes are related. And that's why ENTC kind of like uh, both auditory and vestibular dysfunctions. The hidden hearing loss that you just talked about last, um, you mentioned, you know, loud noises could be the cause of that, like exposure to very loud noise. Are there any other um, known causes, you know, that could, you know, cause this? Yeah, so not, not yet that are known. I'm sure there's probably, there are probably going to be other things, maybe other drugs or something that could be causing it. Um, like, for instance, aminoglycosides also are taken up by the nerve terminals and so could be actually killing nerve terminals simultaneously. And so it could be that at some doses, maybe there's 
you know, it'll kill nerve terminals, but not the hair cell yet, for instance. Uh, so there could be other things, but this is, I mean, this was kind of, it's fairly recent discovery um, and fairly recent appreciation. And when I say recent, I mean in the past couple of years, but so there's, I think there's still likely more things to be discovered in terms of causes of it. But currently the best described is kind of these threshold shifts. But I, there might actually, I think there might actually be some studies on aminoglycosides too that it might be. Because I do know that aminoglycosides are taken up by nerve terminals. Yeah. Uh, with the, like a cochlear implant, is that just a mechanical version of the system that's implanted? Yeah, so replaced? it's an electrical version, actually. So what it does is, let's see if I can. So in the cochlea, what it does is it basically implants itself within the spiral. Okay. Um, so you can think. So if this is the base, what it, they basically stick an electrode array that then spirals up along the cochlea and then the goal is they, they actually deliver an electrical stimulus, and the goal is to bypass the cochlea and basically directly stimulate the nerve fibers themselves, okay? And then, or the nerve cells, because usually the idea, the hope is, is that, that you still have the fibers that are going out there. So mm -hmm. then if you're stimulating near there, then you're actually signaling the nerve fibers. So it basically bypasses the, 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 the hair cells. So, Cochlear implants work for certain types of hearing loss, right? So uh, it does not work for auditory neuropathy. So auditory neuropathy means that there's something wrong with the, spot, with the auditory nerve itself, but it does work for anything, any issues in the organ of cordy or any issues in the, in the ear itself. Because it basically takes a microphone, detects the sound, and then converts that sound into an electrical impulse train that's designed to kind of stimulate the nerve itself. So I was just kind of curious. So you have two people that um, one can hear better than the other one. Which one is more susceptible to noise-induced hearing loss? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so if, if so, when you say these, are you saying these are both normal hearing individuals, or one so has one hearing has loss? like exceptional hearing, and the other one is maybe average. So it, it, there's. I would say that there's not necessarily any evidence to say one would be more susceptible than the other. Um, there are a lot of things that go into susceptibility for noise-induced hearing loss, because there's some people that are more resilient than others. Sure. And some of that is likely genetic, genetically based, okay? But I don't know if it necessarily has to do with um, how good your hearing is. Okay. Like at the outset, but I don't, but I don't, I don't know. Okay. That for sure. Because for instance, for music, for musicians, you can, I mean, some musicians develop, for instance, perfect pitch, right? So, so it's that they're actually able to discriminate smaller increments in frequency than a normal person is, right? And so I think a lot of that happens more in the brain in terms of taking the information that's coming from the ear and then processing that, like, and let's say separating it out to finer, let's say devoting a larger part of their brain to process that type of information. Is anybody, because this is probably early since this is a recent discovery about the hidden hearing loss, has anybody looked into any kind of treatment for that type of hearing Yeah, loss? I mean, the treatments, yeah, so the, the the treatments are the people are looking at um, neural growth factors and things like that. Similar to things that actually people try to do with cochlear implant patients. So one of the things is that like how healthy your nerve is determines how good like your you how good of a candidate or how well you may do with the cochlear implant. There's a lot of other variables associated with it, but you know so. There are things that people look at, you know, oh, like can we deliver some, some neural growth factors to help essentially keep those nerves healthy to prevent them from, like say, degenerating and kind of pulling away from the hair cell and other ways that maybe trying to grow them back to the, to the, to the ear. So there are, I, I would say, 
none of these are clinically um, available, but these are things that are that people are trying to do. And you know, there are a, the, in recent years, there's been a lot of kind of um, startups around auditory stuff and like in, like you know uh, is it, uh, investors. Uh, had, like big investors kind of trying to tap into um, tap into the auditory therapy side because there's actually not a lot currently and so it's one of the most underdeveloped areas in a sense and so there's there's been a lot of these uh, why can I think of it not hedge funds but whatever angel investors and the other one Venture capital. venture capital. There you go. A lot of venture capital going into um, these types of startups recently. So, All right. well, thank you, Anton. Yeah, thank you.